Um, the last but not least speaker is our honored guest from uh, Toronto, uh, Ali Rizvi. I actually want to take a minute to introduce you, Ali. He's the author of The Atheist Muslim, physician, writer, scientist. He's an author of The Atheist Muslim, Journey for Religion and Reason, and a co-host of the popular podcast, Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment. He grew up in Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Libya, and now lives in Toronto. Buy the book and uh, subscribe to the podcast, really. It's a very interesting podcast. Um, guys, I wanna, I wanna share something with you to, to understand, and permit me, Ali, to, to share this, to understand how alive is uh, the struggle of freedom of speech, even even in, uh, even, in, in this, uh, even in this country, which guarantees freedom of speech. And the importance of our work, trying to break taboos and create an environment of, uh, of, of sharing and uh, an environment of dialogue, a safe environment for dialogue. Uh, the museum has shared with me that they actually have gotten a kind of a, a complaint uh, letter about uh, uh, about Ali Rizvi, and they, you know they got more information from me about the speaker because they have an anti-bias policy, and they want to make sure that uh, we are following their anti-bias policy. But uh, allow me to uh, share some of the attacks that we're attacked with. So first of all, we're attacked as. Uh, an atheist organization. We are not an atheist organization. We're an organization that allows dialogue. But because you allow an atheist to speak, you are attacked uh, with, uh, with that, although it's not an attack in itself. We're attacked as an anti-Muslim. How can we be anti-Muslim when we are Muslim? We just want to add the ishness to it to give us the freedom of thought uh, within it. Like Ibrahim says, uh, Ibrahim says uh, he was one of the organizers of Muslim Mission Toronto and he happens to be at the end of the spectrum so he has, he's a former Muslim uh, he says I'm not a Muslim when if someone asks me if you're a Muslim I'm not a Muslim but if someone is taking Muslims to concentration camps then I'm a Muslim so we do belong to Islam no matter how our interpretation of the faith is no matter how much we believe in it, at the end of the day, we also, you know, identify with it, at least culturally. Uh, and Ali Rizvi was attacked in, in so many different attacks that were all non-justified. I'm not going to go through them, but I just want to tell you that there is even attempts to silence us over here. Uh, when Muslimish was found, the first president who was elected to Muslim was a, was a, was a Muslim. He was a principal of an Islamic school. Uh, always, always, we always have imams and people who academically represent the Islamic point of view in our discussions. We try to be as fair as we can in bringing all spectrum of, uh, of belief. But we, so your presence here is support of this work and is very important. I have a good announcement to make. I'll make it afterwards when we start uh, the panel discussion. With no further ado, Ali Rizvi. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ali Rizvi. Uh, thank you for the introdu introduction, uh, Wassam. And uh, today we're talking about one of my favorite topics. Uh, it's Islam and science. Uh, this is the main reason. When, when, I, when I was raised in a Shia Muslim family, uh, one of my biggest interests was uh, in science. I eventually went and went to graduate school for biochemistry. I uh, became a physician. Uh, I earned my uh, um, uh, residency in pathology, did a fellowship in cancer pathology. So I've been in science for uh, decades now. And I was always interested in it uh, since I was a child. And I was always taught that, is, that Islam is very pro-science, that Islam is the, the religion that actually supports, I mean, science supports and science validates Islam. And, and there's uh, no doubt about this. 
And um, this was very interesting to me. That's why I started reading about it. Um, things didn't turn out the way that I thought they would. And ultimately, I rejected religion. I didn't reject religion for a lot of the other reasons people do. People do it for um, uh, issues of justice, issues of uh, you know, politics, oppression. Uh, all, there are all kinds of reasons, and they're all justified. These are not, I mean, these are, these are people uh, who are my friends. I've heard some incredible stories of people who've had to reject religion, not just Islam, but other religions as well. Uh, but for me, uh, the rejection of Islam and all religion uh, came through science, because of science. And here's the thing, we've, we've talked about a lot of the details, we've talked about verses in the Quran, uh, we've talked about uh, you know, claims, scientific claims versus religious claims, uh, science answers the how questions, religion apparently answers the why questions. So there are all these different arguments. I've addressed them all in my book, but I want to just zoom out a little bit and just talk about the one basic thing that all religions have in common, and that is the idea, the very concept of faith. And for me, when I think of Islam and the narrative, everything we see in the media, uh, we hear Islam is associated with terrorism, it's associated with subjugation of women, human rights abuses, all of these other things that you see. But I think that the, the most, for me, the most problematic and sinister aspect of uh, the Islamic religion uh, is what it shares with all of the other religions. And that is the, the concept of faith, the idea that uh, we should believe things without evidence. And I know there's been some discussion about that today in some panels, and. Um, there were great discussions, so I'm really happy that I came here. I know I came a little bit late, but uh, whatever I heard, I think, uh, gave me a lot to think about and to respond to. So, let's start with that. And so, the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about how uh, uh, science and faith, they're about religious science, science and religious faith um, differ. And to me, there are three different ways. Right? So science and faith, they, they have the same goal. They want to arrive at truth. What is real? Um, what is true? But how do they do it? What is the process? Science, as I said, relies on evidence. So no matter how elegant or how beautiful your idea is, your speculation is, science will discard it. It will uh, just throw it in the garbage mercilessly if it's not backed up by nature and it cannot be validated uh, with experiment. So it has to stand up to the scrutiny of experiment. Now on the other hand, faith, by definition, what does faith mean? It, it means to believe in the absence of evidence. Uh, and, and this is something, you know, people, people ask sometimes, well, you know, there's blind faith, but then there's also reasonable faith. There's a difference between the two. There, there's no difference between the two. All faith, all religious faith, all sort of uh, faith in claims that you can't prove, is, it's all blind faith because there is no evidence. Does this, is this a dais or a podium? Like, is it, what's the word for it? No, oh, whatever it is. This thing I'm standing at, we know it exists because we can see it. We don't have faith that this exists. We don't have faith that these speakers exist. We know they exist. We know them because we can observe them. There is evidence, clear, observable evidence that they exist. Um, you don't have faith that the chairs that you're sitting on exist. You know that they do. You can physically demonstrate their existence. So, but if you have faith in something, that quite literally means to believe unquestioningly often uh, and, and even revere rumors or hearsay in a sense, that what somebody said a long time ago, what was written in a book, you know, thousands of years ago or, or hundreds of years ago, is, is the truth, you know, truth by way of revelation. Um, and this, to me personally, is a problem. This is something that I can't reconcile uh, with the way that I think. So that is the first way that they differ. Second, um, scientific inquiry. When you ask a scientific question, you investigate a scientific claim, right? you start with the assumption that you could be wrong. So falsifiability, falsifiability is the, the ability of a proposition to be proven false. This is a fundamental component of the scientific method. So what is the scientific method? It begins with a hypothesis. 
right? A hypothesis is an educated guess. Uh, you follow the hypothesis, you test it via experiment. Um, the experiment either verifies or nullifies it, right? Based on the evidence. Um, or you may not reach a conclusion. Now, what happens with faith? Faith begins with a conclusion. You don't come to the conclusion, you begin with the conclusion. So, you know, people say, okay, uh, you know, you have, um, you're allowed to question, you have elements of faith, sure, you can question it, you can doubt it. Uh, you, can, you can doubt it, but, and you, know, you can look for evidence for it, but ultimately there is a conclusion there. You can say it's not there, but it's there. Examples of these conclusions that we start with, these preconceptions, Jesus is the son of God, that is your belief. Um, Muhammad is Allah's messenger, right? The Quran is the word of Allah. So once you believe these things, then you can go ahead and investigate them, but you usually never question that, you know, the Quran is the word of Allah or Muhammad is his messenger. Eventually, you go backwards from the conclusion, you pick out the evidence that supports your conclusion, uh, and then you arrive at the same conclusion. It's very circular. So this is something that I saw a lot in practice uh, when I was growing up. I had some, I, some of my best teachers, and I still have good relationships with them, um, most inspiring teachers, were, were religious people. Uh, my physics teacher was also my uh, Islamic studies teacher when I was growing up in Pakistan. So we always used to have these discussions, and, and he still, to this day, had a great impact on me just because he made me think. He knows the conclusion I reached, and he's very comfortable with it. Uh, he disagrees, but, but he does. And, and th this is the one thing that we, all, we were always at loggerheads about. So, the third point, the difference between science and faith, is science is not only open to um, innovation or modification or evolution of, of uh, its ideas. Uh, but it thrives on them. That's what the heart of science is. And here's one place where I want to quote Penn Jillette. If you're familiar with Penn Jillette, he is a magician and he's also a famed skeptic and, and uh, an atheist activist. And uh, he has pointed out that in the past, uh, you, had, you, know, you had the agricultural revolution, you had the, um, the industrial revolution, and you had all of these religions and power systems, but the scientific revolution was unique in that it was driven by three simple words. I don't know. That was it. Was, I don't know. You started with that. You started with a hypothesis. I want to investigate it. I don't know what the answer is. I'm going to find out. I'm going to go question it. I may experiment and I may look at it for years and years and years, but I may still not reach to your conclusion. And then I don't have to make up any answers. I can just say, I don't know and the work will continue. That is something that no previous revolution, no previous power system, no religion, no political power system had, had ever, have ever said before. Um, so, th so this is another thing, that science thrives on innovation. It thrives actually, in a way, on ignorance and, and openness. Um, and, uh, we had a discussion here, and the, the, the panel that you were on, um, sir, it was, about, uh, you know, we talked about how science can be misused and, you know, people uh, use consensus as authority. And that, that a lot of that is true. There are a lot of problems in science. There are reproducibility problems. But how do you fix those problems in science? With science. Right? What do you do if you have a problem with, okay, this study, I don't know if this study is accurate. It's not really working out in practice you go and you do reproducibility studies. Other people do the same study in different places under different circumstances, and they come up with their conclusions. And with eventually the food pyramid and those examples that were given, uh, eventually those views evolve. Uh, nobody is called a heretic right, for it. Yes, there is social pressure. Yes, there are people who write, and they complained about Einstein's photoelectric effect. But uh, nobody called for him uh, to be hanged. At least the scientific community didn't. Uh, you know, the Catholic Church may have persecuted Galileo, uh, but uh, his fellow scientists, uh, they didn't. You, know, you may have opinions, but you're not going to uh, persecute or uh, actually harm somebody just because they think differently. You, the debate is always vibrant, it can be heated, but it doesn't result in the kind of 
uh, it doesn't produce the same kind of results that religious conflicts, for example, could, um, show. So, yes, innovation and modification and evolution are at the heart of the scientific method. But faith, and particularly Abrahamic faith, including Islam, is fundamentally characterized by infallibility, infallibility of the prophet, divinity of the scripture, immutability of the holy text. God himself protects the scripture. Um, what historically, those people who have challenged right, these, these ideas, these precepts, what have they been called? They've been called heretics, they've been called blasphemers, they've been called apostates, and what has happened to them? They've paid in horrific ways for their digressions throughout history. Right. So, again, can't stress this enough, critical scrutiny and skepticism are at the very heart of what drives science forward, and, and it has worked. Now, the language of scientific inquiry is uh, conservative, conservative not in the political uh, sense, uh, thankfully, but it's, it's conservative in the sense that it is uh, cautious and it is humble. So evolution, you know, we've talked a lot about evolution, we've heard a lot about evolution today. Evolution is a fact that is now verified not only by the evidence of paleontologists, but also by really strong, robust molecular genetic evidence. When people have looked at DNA, they've looked at the molecular elements in, 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 in cells and the nuclei and in the genome, and it has been verified. But what do we call it? Do we call it the fact of evolution? We don't. We still call it a theory. It's still termed a theory. And this is, this is where the humility of science comes in. It acknowledges that there could be more. Right? So this is very confusing to a lot of the uh, a lot of the people who are uh, naive about science, about the terminology of science. Well, if it's proven and if it's a fact, why is it still called a theory? If it's proven, shouldn't it be called a law, like the laws of motion? And it's true, there are laws of motion. So let's talk about this and let's explain this. Now, so what is a law in science? In science, a law is just the description of a phenomenon. So Newton's law of gravity, um, what is it? It, it describes uh, the attraction between two objects. So you have the law of gravity, and this is exactly what it is. It says that the force of attraction between two bodies is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. That is the law of gravitation. So, and this is, and the reason it's a law is because you can use it. It describes what gravity is. You can calculate the gravitational force between two objects. Like, for example, if you drop a bowling ball on the Earth, you can, you can, you can actually calculate the, the gravitational force between them using uh, this law. But the theory of gravity, what is the theory of gravity? That doesn't just describe what gravity is. It describes how or why this attraction occurs. So a, the, the only way that a scientific hypothesis can gain the status of a theory is after it has been rigorously tested after it's, the, ex, lots of experiments have been done and it's been demonstrated over and over and over to be correct, still termed a theory. So theories in science are works in progress. No. This doesn't mean that they're not true. It just means that they're added to and they evolve and they're modified as more and more evidence is discovered and they, and they grow. So, for instance, going back to the theory of evolution, um, after Darwin first proposed it in, in 1859, um, and he, he proposed it based on the evidence at that time, was evidence from biogeography, from his travels. Uh, it was evidence from comparative anatomy, from uh, physiology, from embryology, and, and so, several other um, areas. But over the next 150 years, there were more pieces of evidence that came in. The fossil record, for instance, that carbon dating fossil record and then later on DNA sequencing technology. So even though evolution still had a tremendous amount of evidence for it, it was strengthened over time with the advent of the discovery of the fossil record and the analysis of the fossil record, and then ultimately by molecular biology and molecular genetics. And today we know this, we've discovered new things. With DNA sequencing, for instance, we found a lot more about it. We found, 
just a second. And we found that the, the relationships, the evolutionary relationships among living species shows that we're very, very closely related to each other when it comes to our genomes. And we've, they've also confirmed that beyond a doubt, and this is actually true, that all living things arose from a single common ancestor that lived about four billion years ago. We know that now, but it's still called a theory. The theory of gravity, similar kind of trajectory. Uh, Newton's theory of gravity that provided, and the laws of motion, provided us the calculations that helped us eventually get to the moon. Um, but they weren't completely correct. Eventually, uh, you know, I mean, at that time, people knew about Einstein and his theory of relativity, but Einstein's theory of general relativity is the theory of gravity that we use today. Right? So it evolved over time, still called a theory. Now, faith, faith with claims of absolute truth, right? It doesn't have the kind of humility. It doesn't use words like theory, could be wrong, let's see what we can add to it. No, you're going to add something to it, but you're going to get executed. You're going to get thrown in jail, even today, unfortunately. Um, so, f faith has claims of absolute truth and immutable texts, um, and it, it, uh, it has deemed them historically unquestionable on so many occasions. So, you know, the, it, it doesn't work. You can't, it's, people say, you can't pray a rocket into space, right? It's uh, by uh, Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist, and he's also an atheist activist and writer. You know, he said, if you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. And then these, are, these are not things that you can do with, with religious claims. Now, yes, so you, can, can you do this kind of thing with prayer? Not really. Even the most religious people I know right, would easily choose medicine over prayer uh, if they were told to pick one. If you told them you have to choose you know, your, your kid is choking on something, or, you know, you're having a heart attack, or, or somebody has uh, a cancer, and they need therapy for it. Uh, what do you do? What are you going to choose? Do you, you can go with exclusively uh, prayer and, and religious, you can, you can go with religious revelations that, that you believe are true, or you can go with, with medicine and science. Even the most religious people will, I, I shouldn't say 100%, because... Um, thanks to Maja's presentation uh, about <laughs> what percentage of people believe all kinds of ludicrous things. Chocolate milk from brown cows. Well, I mean, there are people who believe that, so I should, I'm not going to make uh, to say 100%. But yes, most people, even the most religious ones, will choose science over, uh, uh, over uh, prayer and over uh, faith every time. And, uh, and, and even religious people, they value evidence-based belief. They, they value it for everything, everything except for their faith. And it's strange. I mean, George Carlin, this quote was attributed to George Carlin. I don't think he actually said it, but it's, it's a great quote. And he said, tell people there's an invisible man in the sky who created the universe, and the vast majority will believe you. Tell them the paint is wet, and they have to touch it to be sure. And that, just, that pretty much summarizes it. So many people, they'll mock each other, they'll, they'll mock others, they'll say, evolution, where's the evidence? Climate change, show me the evidence. You know, what all these scientific claims you're making, uh, what, what is the evidence for the Big Bang Theory? Right? But when it comes to believing in angels, virgins giving birth, winged horses carrying uh, you know, prophets to heaven, uh, resurrections from the dead, you know, all the... They, they don't ask for evidence for that. They just say, you know, this is my, my faith. It's unshakable. They never apply the same kind of scrutiny. Even they apply scientific scrutiny to scientific claims, but they don't apply those, the same kind of scrutiny to, to religious claims. And religious claims, by the way, many of them, virgin birth is a scientific claim. It's not a religious claim. And we'll get to that in a bit. So, you know, they'll ask, well, uh, can you disprove the existence of God or, or angels or, or winged horses? And it, of course, I, I can't disprove the existence of Zeus or Santa Claus either. You know, another, none, of, none of us can. So, but that doesn't mean that those things are true, or that they can be true. 
If it did, if the fact that you can't disprove things uh, means that they must be real, then obviously there could be no end to what we all believe. So as I was growing up and I was coming across these, these ideas and I was thinking about them, I was beginning to see that you know, God was kind of a lazy answer. Um, and you know, my, my family believed in God, a lot of my extended relatives and the immediate relatives still believe in God. Many of my friends are, are Muslims. Um, and we've always had these discussions. It's just not something that I found stimulating. I always found it a little bit lazy. And this is the whole idea of the God of the gaps. There are gaps in knowledge. For every scientific question that doesn't yet have an answer, you know, you, I started getting comfortable with saying, I don't know. It's a really, really difficult thing to say that, well, I don't know. Um, but uh, there's a big temptation to, instead of say, I don't know, you say, God did it. Right? So usually when I hear the terms now, God did it, to me, I translate that as, well, okay, you don't know either. We don't know. So before the discoveries of evolution, before the Big Bang, before you know, heliocentrism, that you know, the, 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 everything revolves around the sun and the you know, structure of DNA by Watson and Crick, before all of these landmark discoveries that happened in just the last you know, couple of hundred years, um, these gaps were huge. They were massive. And, and yes, before this, many of the scientists themselves, the most scientists nowadays are not religious. Uh, you know, they're, they're not believers. But before evolution and before all of these, uh, these other ideas, uh, many scientists were. Isaac Newton was a very religious man, and many other scientists were as well. But uh, because of these, these gaps in our knowledge were really, really big, they were gaping, well, there were massive gaps. Uh, but today, there are more narrow, right? So, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's an astrophysicist and a science educator, uh, he put this really eloquently when he said that, you know, God, over time, he's an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as time moves on and as we, as we discover more and more things about the world and the nature and, and about nature and, and the objective reality that surrounds us. So, my big problem with the God of the gaps issue, the, 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 the claim that God did it, is that it kills human curiosity. It's a, it's a very difficult thing. Uh, I see this, I saw this a lot growing up in Pakistan. You know, you're born, uh, in, in, from the day of birth, you're, you're told that you know, all of the answers that you want, they're all in this book. You know, what is the incentive now to look for things? You see people making the same mistake over and over and over again because they don't really learn from their experience or their observation of the world around them. They just keep going back to what the revelation is and, and what what they consider to be divine truth. And um, they keep on saying, making the same mistake over and over again, and there's no personal evolution. Um, and speaking of evolution, I eventually grew to, I, I couldn't share this idea that, uh, that, that you talked about um, here, and it was, a, and thank you for that. I, I only got the, I saw only part of your speech and I heard the panel, so um, again, it made me think, but I, I disagree. I, I, I can't reconcile uh, faith with uh, the reality of evolution anymore. This is something that I, I did think, uh, one of my um, sort of scientific heroes is a man named Francis Collins. Um, Dr. Collins is, you know, he was running the Human Genome Project uh, for a time. Uh, he uh, did a lot of work on, on the gene for cystic fibrosis, and he's a believer, so he, he's a phenomenal scientist. He was actually uh, one of the consulting physicians for Christopher Hitchens, is one of the most sort of, uh, uh, I guess, one of the most militant anti-theists uh, ever, and they they became very good friends because he treated him when he was in his last stages of esophageal cancer. So uh, Francis Collins, I still have a tremendous amount of respect for him, but he actually thinks that uh, scientific, uh, the, the theory of evolution, and religion, in his case, Christianity are completely compatible. And this is also a view that has been, uh, you know, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, he had the view of, uh, uh, he, he wrote about non-overlapping magisteria, the NOMA, um, as it's known, NOMA, 
And he said that because they dealt with different modes of inquiry, science deals with facts, and religion deals with values and spiritual meaning, um, there is no overlap. They can exist in their own spheres. Right? And it's a beautiful idea when you think about it, because you know, who doesn't like coexistence? It's very nice. But that doesn't mean that it works. It doesn't work that way. Now, did science, and this is what I said, does science, the topic here is, science, can Islam and science coexist? It obviously does. We have Islam in the world, we have Muslims in the world, and, and we have science. The whole world runs according to science. I, they can clearly coexist. I just don't think that they're compatible. And I, I don't buy this uh, Noma idea or Francis Collins' belief anymore. Uh, number one, because it's clear that many of the claims that are made by religion, again, creation of the universe, claimed by religion, uh, virgins giving birth, Jesus being resurrected, uh, animals that are, you know, the big flood comes and a boat saves animals, and, you know, no matter how metaphorical it is, uh, all, all of these things are not religious claims. These are scientific claims. You can put them to the test, right? So it's not a separate sphere. It's not, not non-overlapping. I mean, these are things you can actually find out about. Can a virgin give birth? How was the universe created? These are things, these are questions that we have answers to or partial answers to, and we're continuing to research and find more information on. These are, these are not religious claims. They're scientific claims. And uh, to me, the, the one claim that was a deal breaker, and yeah, this is after you study evolution, and this is something, a question you come across, and it's very, very, I, I think that if you truly study and understand evolution, you can't get past this, is this idea that Adam was the first human being, or that well, there was a first human being. And if you truly, again, understand how evolution works, you know that this can't be true, because, because Adam never existed. You know, there was never any first human being. Now, how is this possible? As human beings, we can't comprehend the vast scale of evolution. When we're talking about hundreds of millions of years, right, billions of years, we can't comprehend the, the way that, you know, the, those kinds of time scales. So imagine this, you know, you have, you have a daughter, right? From the day she's born until she's age 18, you take a picture of her every single day. You take a headshot, take a picture just, uh, of her face every single day from the day she's born until her 18th birthday. And then just imagine that you take all those pictures and you put them on a shelf beginning to end, just a very, very long shelf. Right? And, and you put them all there. And then uh, I ask you to take out any two consecutive pictures. You take out the two consecutive pictures, she's gonna look the same. It's one day after the other. You widen the, uh, the, the gap between them and I say, okay, let's take out two pictures six months apart. You'll see a little bit of change. Two years apart, you'll see a much more significant change. And as the time goes, you know, as, as, the, as the gap becomes bigger, you're gonna see more of a change. But day to day, you're not going to notice any difference in the picture. And this is how evolution works. You know, from one parent generation to the next, um, every living thing that came from parents was, in this, it was the same species as its parents. When we talk about the evolution of species, it's a retrospective process. We look back and say, okay, after this time period, this species evolved into this species and so on. That's how we do it. But it's not like, you know, you had, uh, um, what was it, you know, uh, Australopithecus and then suddenly you had, uh, you know, Homo whatever. Um, it, it doesn't, it, one species didn't give rise to another one over generations. Right? And this is, again, I will, um, uh, here's, yeah, Richard Dawkins actually used this analogy uh, for this as well. Uh, he said, at some point, we cease to think of ourselves as middle-aged, and we start to think ourselves, of ourselves as old. Right? And this is something that spoke to me very personally, because, uh, <laughs> you know, middle-aged, getting old. And, but but it's, it's true, you don't go to bed middle-aged and wake up old. Right? It's a gradual process. It's something that you say retrospectively. Well, you know, it was around this time when, when I started getting, getting much older. So I've met many physicians, I have uh, physician friends, one of them is actually an MD, PhD, and his PhD is in molecular biology, he's a Pentecostal Christian uh, from Nigeria, and he denies evolution. 
And so he was, a, he was a resident with me, and you know, when we were doing uh, a residency in, in, in pathology, so he's also a pathologist. He doesn't believe in evolution. And we see argue about it all the time. He just compartmentalizes his brain. And these are very intelligent, very educated people who are fully aware that there is such a thing called antimicrobial resistance or the antibacterial resistance, which I, I think so you, you mentioned as well. Um, just that the idea that bacteria evolved to become resistant to penicillin right in front of our very eyes. And it's amazing when you find out the details, when you, when you realize what the details are. Right? Penicillin has this this, uh, this component in it called beta-lactam. And the bacteria that became resistant to it developed an enzyme in just, <laughs> it wasn't even that fast, it was just in a matter of years, called beta-lactamase that allowed it to become resistant, just destroy penicillin. And they, the, the penicillin wouldn't work on a lot of these bacterial strains. That is evolution. I mean, it's happening right in front of our eyes. It is a fact. So. So these are people, I mean, this friend of mine who doesn't believe in evolution, the physician, he knows about this. He understands it. Uh, but there are many, I, I can't say many, there are a handful of very qualified, very smart scientists and doctors who deny evolution. Um, what do they all have in common? What do you think? Uh, very deep religiosity. Right. And I had a great example of this that I think everyone here will know is Dr. Ben Carson. You know Dr. Ben Carson? Um, the youngest head of pediatric neurosurgery in, in, uh, at, at, in John Hopkins' history. Like, just a fantastic physician. If you watch his videos talking about it, the TV coverage of him as a physician, brilliant, really impressive guy. Right. He's an evolution denier. He calls evolution the work of the devil. Uh, he is, uh, he says that the Earth's geological layers came about due to a large flood. All of these claims, it's, and all of those things exist with, with all of that brilliance. And this, again, is a very sinister thing to me about faith. When you, when you have, when you think that faith is, is also a legitimate uh, a, a method to get to the truth, the, the process, uh, it, it can... Really, I, I feel personally it can infect and, and just turn the minds of brilliant people often to mush, at least partially. Right? So, another thing they say well, to falsify evolution, you know, what do we do? There's gaps in the fossil record. I mean, you have all of these fossils, and then there's, we don't have any fossils for this, like, you know, two million years or a few hundred thousand years. So, what, what, about, what about that? That's evidence that evolution isn't continuous. And the thing is, you know, real life, it just doesn't work that way. You never have a, a full video of every murder being committed. You have pieces of it, and there are gaps. You put the pieces of the puzzle together, and you make a reasonable conclusion as to whether somebody committed a murder or not. Um, that is how evidence works. And this is why, again, another thing in science, proof. The word proof is a bad word, a taboo word in science. It's great in math, mathematics, different, and I, perfectly legitimate, legitimate, but in science, proof is a bad word. You always say, evidence in support of. That is, that is the way that we talk in science. Right? So you, when, you, when you go back and, and you look at evolution, but these gaps, they don't disprove evolution. Now, what would disprove evolution is if uh, a gap in the, um, this is as JBS Haldane said, you know, is if you went to the Precambrian era and you looked at all the fossils there and there were some gaps, in that gap you found the fossil of a rabbit, right, or some kind of mammal. Then you would know, you're like, okay, there's a problem. Now we have to throw out everything we know about evolution. We found a mammal in the Precambrian era. Let's go back to the drawing books. That is when, you know, you have a problem with it, but that has never happened, not once. Everything that we've seen when it comes to the evolution, the fossil record, is completely consistent with what the theory was. And, and there are countless, countless fossils that have been found. So, um, I'm going to skip ahead just so that... You know, yeah, so, there's this whole idea of, uh, again, science answers the how questions and religion answers the why questions. 
Uh, so this is a very, very common claim, and it's not just among Muslims, it's, it's across the board. And I've deliberately tried to focus this not just on Islam, but on, on religion overall in general, and, and just the idea of faith versus science. And uh, people often, you know, they present this as a statement of fact, you know, science answers the how, how questions, and religion, the why questions. Uh, but, and it sounds nice, again, it sounds very poetic, it's got a little, a little bit of symmetry to it, it's almost musical, uh, but uh, it's just not true. You know, it sounds like there's a space here for everybody, we can all get along, it's just not true. So religion doesn't provide answers, that's one thing. Uh, religion, for all we know, as far as we know, makes them up. We have no evidence that these answers are true. We don't, the amount of, how much evidence do we have for the claim that Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden, for instance? Right, that's how, or in, in the Islamic account, uh, that, that they were sent down to earth from paradise. And uh, the, this happened because Eve ate the forbidden fruit. So, how much evidence do we have for that? We have no evidence for that. I mean, this isn't an answer to anything. It's just a claim that has absolutely no evidence. It's, it's like hearing a rumor and saying, okay, I believe this much less a rumor from a very long time ago. So it, it, and this is very difficult for a scientifically oriented mind to understand that how could, how could this be equivalent? Oh, this is the why questions and the how questions. How, there is no equivalence, right? And if it said, so if you said that science answers the how questions or tries to answer the how questions and religion addresses the why questions, that is a, that's a more true statement. That's something I can kind of get behind. Now, it also isn't true that, that religion only speaks to the why questions. Uh, religion also makes very strong how claims. Again, the claims that how the earth came to exist, you know, how humans came into being, how women was crea were created from a man's rib and so on. Uh, these, we know for a fact that these claims are false. They're absolutely not true. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of evidence-backed answers for this. Uh, and the answers we have are because of the, thanks to science. Right? So, this, uh, never mind. So, it was, yeah, so it was tough for me. I think that these answers uh, were too lazy. Once, once you believe that a supernatural God uh, created all of these things, you come up with a whole bunch of other problems. Evolution, again, the idea, did, did God set the process of evolution in motion? Is evolution, you know, we talked about this, is it beautiful or is it, you know, a horrendous process? Now, I think it's beyond just the beauties in the eye of the beholder. I think the fundamental um, elements of evolution by natural selection are based on survival of species. And that survival is always, always, necessarily at the expense of other living species. Um, animals have to eat other animals to survive, they have to eat other living things, plants, whatever, to survive. Um, they fight for territory, uh, they have to, uh, they fight for mates, uh, they, uh, they forcibly uh, mate with the females to propagate the species. It's, uh, uh, most of it, it's the might is right attitude, right, the, the whole, you're basically getting power by force. Yeah, the weapons race. It is essentially a weapons race. So it's a good example of the weapons race is the cheetah and the gazelle. Right, so you have cheetahs that run after gazelles because they have to eat the gazelles to survive. The gazelles have to run away from the cheetah because they have to not be eaten to survive. And with evolution, this is the kind of process that evolution is, that with evolution, uh, every generation of cheetah over generations, the cheetah gets to run faster so it can survive and cast a gazelle. And, and throughout the, 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 the gazelle, with evolution, has to run faster to escape the cheetah. This is sadistic. You know, what you're doing is you're, you're taking two species and you're making them fight with each other. It's like when, when the U.S. was selling weapons to both Iran and Iraq at the same time. Was that the counter affair? And it, it, it's like that. And it's... it's if human beings did it, if governments do it, we think that this is sadistic and it's evil. But this is the nature of evolution. Evolution is not a pretty process. It's not a beautiful, there are many beautiful things about life. We're alive, we see the world around us, and yes, 
we can we can sit here and we can you know enjoy we can see a lot of beautiful things I, I for example I can see beautiful things because of my contact lenses I'm almost blind my prescription is like minus 6.25 minus 6.75 without my contact lenses I can't see anything or my glasses um, and this allows me to see the beauty in life and nature but the thing is you know few centuries ago a few millennia ago I would have been wiped out I would have been blind. I, the, when we lived in the might is right world, um, there's some wild animal that would have just come and eaten me. I, I wouldn't be here, you know, doing this talk and annoying everybody. So, so this is, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's as easy as, as saying that, you know, the beauty is if you see it or if you don't. I think very fundamentally the processes that drive evolution are, are really, really rough and really, really troubling. And, and we have done, as human beings, you know, things to try and, and, and mitigate that. Now, in closing, I want to go back to the beginning. I just wanted to say that sentence. Uh, it's fun. The, the, for me, uh, it's the same thing that, you know, did God start evolution? The other question, now this is really what, what, was, what the turning point for me was, is did God start the Big Bang? Why can't you believe both? Yes, the Big Bang Theory, and yeah, it's completely legitimate, uh, but, uh, you know, God started it. Evolution is completely legitimate, we believe in it, but God started it. Now, with the Big Bang, this is something that kind of kept me holding on for a very long time. Because people would say, no, no, we've got the theory, the Big Bang Theory. And I would think, but who started it? What happened before the Big Bang? That was a question, and that's why I held on to There were, there were times I kind of... I didn't really believe in Islam, I didn't believe, but I really did believe that there was a God uh, that, that created everything because there had to have been, right? There had to have been a first cause. So the problem with the, with the first cause, right, is um, the same problem with the non-first cause is if that, you know, if uh, the universe was created by God, then who created God? If the universe is so magnificent and amazing, that it must have had a creator. That creator must be even more magnificent and amazing. So that must have a creator. Would they say, well, no, that creator doesn't really need a creator. So why does the universe need a creator? You know, by, the, by the same argument. So that's a, that's a pretty classic argument. Uh, but it's, it, there's a, there's a, you eventually have to go back further and further and further. You have to come up, with, and this is where philosophers came up with the idea of the first cause because you have this problem of infinite regress. You know, what created and then who created that and who created that, and eventually there has to have been a first cause. Problem is, a first cause, this, this argument, uh, this philosophical argument, assumes that time is eternal. And this is something that people thought for the longest time until Einstein came around that, well, time is constant, you know, there's nothing, time never changes, it doesn't slow down, it doesn't speed up. Guess what? It does. So this is, the, the t this is when um, things completely changed for me. And when I, when I really learned about the Big Bang, I learned that the Big Bang wasn't just the beginning of the universe and matter, it was the beginning of time itself. That statement is a contradiction. Beginning of time. You can't really have the word beginning if time doesn't exist. So this is just kind of a clue to the kind of, um, the, the, uh, I was going to say a mind F word, but I don't want to say that right now, but the, the, this whole thing is. But um, now this, is, this is a really, really beautiful idea. It's also so strange that we are, as human beings, are incapable of imagining it. How can there be no such thing as time? How can time not exist? So everything that we say, we say beginning, end, and we say that, uh, you know, every, before, after, when, then, now, later, tomorrow, today, all of our language, everything, the way we describe the world around us is described uh, on a temporal basis, using terms that are completely dependent on the idea of time being constant, the one thing that we know works. They only work if time exists. So it's so inextricably ingrained into nature, the concept of time, that we cannot imagine our existence without it. But, according to the Big Bang Theory, or the current version of it that is accepted, you know that there's evidence for, there was a quote-unquote time 
when time itself didn't exist. That was at the point of the Big Bang. So when you ask what happened before the Big Bang, if time doesn't exist, before doesn't exist. There's no such thing as before. It's very weird, I know, but imagine you know, the way that physicists describe this is they say that, uh, you know, imagine you're standing at the North Pole. The North Pole is just a point at the top of the world. Imagine you're standing there and you're looking down the North Pole, that point is between your feet, and I tell you to walk north. What are you going to tell me? Like I'm, I'm here, that question, like what you're saying doesn't make sense. You're telling me to walk north. I'm on the North Pole. How far anywhere I walk from here is going to be southward. Right? So it's, it's the same kind of thing. When time doesn't exist at the Big Bang, there's no such thing as before. The question itself doesn't make sense. So now there are other idea, theories to this. This again, the Big Bang theory is just a theory. Right? Uh, it's complex, it's really bizarre, but it's also very simple and very elegant at the same time. Now, is it true? That's a question. And you know, the answer to this is that we don't know but there is more evidence that supports this than evidence that supports, you know, uh, let there be light and there was light, or any of the creationist claims. So, if we didn't, for example, uh, one of the reasons that we know this is wherever you have a higher level of gravitational force, like close to the surface of the Earth, time ticks slower. In space, where all the GPS satellites are, time ticks faster. So on Earth, we have to constantly correct for this time ticking difference uh, in order to make our GPS systems work. If we didn't, our GPS systems would be off by 10 kilometers per day. And that would accumulate over time. It's about 300 kilometers a month. So people can say, well, God created the universe outside of time. And this, again, doesn't make sense because space and time, again, are, are interlinked. And I won't get into that a whole lot. Now, the point is, I did not know whether this is true. Nobody knows whether this is absolutely true. The evidence is still it's there for it, but there are many other theories. There's the idea of the multiverse, there, there's the idea of the big crunch and an internal kind of, uh, you know, big bang, big crunch and so on. There's, there's many, the oscillating universe. Um, but that's all beside the point. The point is that this was a possibility. And it was probably even, it, it might even been a probability. And the, I, that idea alone, that time can speed up and, and, and slow down, this is the point where I said, okay, I'm so inspired and so full of awe and I want to know so much more about this that I had to let religion go. I didn't think, I'm like, why was the supposed, this creator of a universe that works this way, why is he telling us how much our daughters should inherit compared to our sons? Why is he so concerned about punishing people you know, who oppose his authority? Why is he telling us who should, we should have sex with? Why does he care whether we eat pork or what we do to our foreskins? And this is, I mean, this is the, the being that created nebulae, that created time-distorting black holes, that created hundreds of billions of stars and galaxies. Why is the, the religion, the Abrahamic religions, why are they so narrow and so human? So I'll conclude over here um, to people who believe. You know, this is what I would say. And this is as, as somebody who at one point believed. Even if you do believe that a God created the universe, right, why, why go to a Messiah who came centuries ago or, or a book from thousands of years ago to get closer to him? You know, years after I'm gone, if you want to get to know about me, what are you going to do? You're going to read the things that I wrote. You're going to, you're going to talk to the people that knew me. Uh, whatever I left behind, you're going to study what I left behind, and, and that's what's going to give you the best picture of me. So, instead of going to books and messiahs, why not study the creation that is all around you? And the Quran itself says this, study the creation that is all around you. That unfortunately is what made me an atheist eventually. But, um, there is a name for it. The study of the nature all around you, there's a name for it. And that name is science. That's what science is. Simply the study of nature. That's it. And the language of science is, ma is mathematics. It's not Hebrew or Aramaic or Arabic. It doesn't vary geographically depending on where you are. It's mathematics is the same. Whether you're in Israel, whether you're in the West Bank, whether you're on Mars, it all works the same way. It's, it's universal. 
And this is, this is the nature around you. That is, if you believe in God, that is God's language to describe nature, God's creation. And the study of that nature is called science. So, you know, why would you want to rely on faith without evidence when the evidence is so much more breathtaking and so much more amazing? Um, and, and that's where the beauty to me lies. Uh, you know, if you could sum up all of this in one sentence, I would say, uh, ask real questions. You know, don't try to rely on false answers. Questions are good. The kind of answers that give you more questions and, and, and just living on questions and accepting the fact that we don't know and sometimes we can't know is, I think, the reason to stay alive. That there's a purpose of life when we talk about the purpose of life. That's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ali. There's no words really to recognize Ali. Uh, when we first uh, started the movement in 2012, 2013, there weren't many uh, Muslims uh, with these thoughts that have expressed themselves publicly. Ali was one of the first ones who does this publicly and he pays a heavy price in terms of risk to his own self and his family that he carries around. Uh, for the cause of defending really freedom of speech and freedom of conscience and uh, you know rationalism and secularism so thank you very much for that Ali there is you know if it would be childish to offer you a, a plaque or something uh, compared to the to the sacrifices that you do and thank you for coming here Muslims cannot afford paying you know uh, speakers like Ali but he came here as a volunteer so thank you very much I'm going to take a, a question from Mr. Thank you. Uh, that's to Mr. Ali, of course, Dr. Ali. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for correcting me about evolution being beautiful. Uh, what I meant in it is the understanding and seeing how evolution works. It is beautiful seeing how it is, but yeah, how much species go into evolution, that's a painful process, of course, for any species. And thanks for correcting me anyway. I agree that I was wrong by saying it this way. Um, my question is, I noticed that all the speakers, including you, accused religion of what people are doing, people of religion are doing. And I think we should s separate between the two. Whatever Muslims are doing, it's not necessarily Islam. And uh, there's a big misunderstanding in it. Um, for example, if I take the uh, uh, the sterilization of women in the United States back in the 20s and 30s based on the science, science of evolution. Or if we take the reduction of the Aryan race that caused the World War II, caused 70 million people to die. Do I say science is wrong? Do I deny science? Or do I deny those actions by those people and keep science out of that? Uh, that's one, th one thing. Uh, and definitely there's a big misunderstanding. You just mentioned uh, beat up your wife. It's not in the Holy Quran to beat up anybody, including wife. This is a big misunderstanding. Mis misinterpretation of the of the verse, and as a result, mistranslation. Uh, but this is, I guess, I have the, question, I have the subject now. Uh, my question is, uh, you put in faith and science at the same basket. Science, yes, I have to prove things. I expect proof for any scientific claim. But faith is when you cannot prove scientifically, that's when you have faith, either you accept it or you do not accept it. If you can reject it, then I stand with you. But if you cannot reject it, then I have a right to have that faith. I know. Yeah, I, I, I think you, uh, you absolutely have the right to have that faith. Um, but the, what I'm talking about, uh, there's a difference between respecting people's, uh, this kind of goes to the evolution thing we're talking about, there's a difference between having, uh, respecting the right of people to have faith, uh, which we all should respect, versus respecting what the beliefs are themselves. So there's this sort of general idea nowadays that we need to respect each other's beliefs, we need to respect each other's beliefs, 
But there are a lot of really crazy beliefs that people have. I mean, we're being colloquial here, but there are people who believe that the Holocaust didn't happen. There are people who believe you know, that uh, you know little girls should be circumcised. There, there are many people who believe uh, terrible things. And do they have the right to believe them? I think that they do. They, I, I believe in the right that people have to believe in these things. Um, I don't think that we need to respect the beliefs themselves. We have to respect people's rights to have those beliefs. So, and that's where we're having the discussion. Um, as for you know, what you said about uh, evolution being beautiful, I, I have to say I agree with you. I think seeing how evolution works um, is... Learn about something like evolution as a scientist or as a physician, it is truly one of the most awe-inspiring and mind-blowing things you're going to go through in life, just seeing how it all happened. So as far as that goes, I, I do agree with you. <clears throat> the third point you had about that uh, these are the actions of... Uh, wh why are you blaming the religion for the actions of the people? Uh, in some cases, uh, that is true. There are people who do things in the name of religion that are not really part of the religion, and I, I have seen that. Uh, but. I think that the opposite is also true. In my experience, especially nowadays, I think that most people, most human beings, most Muslims even, are, are better than the religion itself. If you, if you look at the Quran and the Hadith, uh, or if you look at uh, even you know, many of the other religions, I have a problem with, like, there are many things in there, like cutting the hands off for people who, who steal in Surah 5 verse 38, or just the idea that, you know, during the, when it says in the Battle of Badr, Surah 8, that, uh, that Allah cast terror into the hearts of the disbelievers and that the angels were sent to strike off their tips and their, and their, and their heads. Things like that. And then that, that would apply to anybody who, else who opposed Allah and His Messenger. So, it's a, there, there are examples of, of things like that that I don't think anybody really, even Muslims, most Muslims believe or practice today, uh, especially most Muslims who live here in, in Western societies. And I, I actually, I, I think that the religion itself has many more problems than the actions of the adherents. And this comes down to how you define religion too. You can, there's a difference in, in my view between Islam and a Muslim. And Islam is a belief system. You know, it's not a human being, it's not living and breathing, it doesn't have any rights. Islam is a set of uh, ideas that are codified in a book, um, and it's, it's a belief system that many people have. It, the Muslim, however, is an evolving definition. Uh, there was a time, you know, 1400 years ago, when Muslim just meant somebody who believes in Islam and practices Islam. Uh, today, we don't really have a consensus on what the word Muslim means. So you can define a religion by a set of beliefs or you can define it by the actions of its adherents and you can look at Osama bin Laden and what, what he does and what ISIS does and you can look at uh, someone like Fareed Zakaria who's a journalist. He has written an article, he wrote an article after you know, Trump announced his Muslim ban and he said that I am a Muslim. But then he also said he's you know, not really a believer. He doesn't go to the mosque, his kids are not Muslims, uh, that he, he's between a deist and an agnostic, yet he calls himself a Muslim as well. So the word Muslim is, is, feels more like an identity to me uh, that is uh, slowly becoming sort of ideologically independent, whereas Islam has a more definitive definition. So that can be very, it can be confusing to a lot of people, but I think it's a very, very significant uh, factor that we have to take into consideration when we're discussing this. Uh, as for the verse, the 434, that you talked about, the beating of the wife, the other buhunna, um, I've written about that in the book, so uh, I would love to send you a copy of the book and, and see what you think about it. Uh, I, there have been revisionist interpretations of it, uh, that it does not mean beat your wife, uh, that the word daraba is used in many different ways, striking a separation, and so on, uh, but the way to uh, talk, the way to think about this, it actually has an analog in English, right? So when you say striking a separation, if you take the word hit, right, it's about the direct object after it that really defines the verb. So if I say I'm going to hit the road, 
That means I'm going to go on a road trip. If I say I'm going to hit the lights, that means I'm going to either turn on the lights or turn off the lights. Um, if I say I want to strike up a conversation with you, that doesn't mean I, I want to hit you. It means that I want to start a conversation with you. But when I say strike a woman, that doesn't mean I want to start a conversation with a woman. It means that I'm going to hit the woman. So the, the direct object, and this is the best way I can explain the, the Arabic aspect of it, you know, this is something that I consult with a lot of people with um, when, I, when I wrote about it, is that it's the direct object that actually defines the, the word Taraba or Adr uh, in the Quran. If it was about striking a separation, then uh, with some, oh, Okay, with some busy, but correct me if I'm wrong. I think that the term would be wadrubu uh, anhunna if it was about striking a separation of the wife. But in any case, well, that, that's something I talk about in my book. I, I would be happy to have a further discussion on it.